Hello, America. It's Clay Jenkinson and David Swenson in the New Enlightenment Radio Network barn at the beginning of the 2016 series of Jefferson Hours. Hardly seems possible. It's amazing that we have now moved into this year. And we're talking, as usual, about Jefferson, but out of character today. And we're really doing what David Swenson calls Jefferson 101. I wish I had a better title. It's a pretty good title. Um, Or how Jefferson became Jefferson would be the other way of putting it. Uh And so we're talking about, we're trying to talk about Jefferson basics because we have a lot of people who are new to the Jefferson Hour. The program has been growing in a really wonderful way. And we have our veteran listeners who like from time to time for us to sort of rewind the tape and start over because every time we do this, we've done it four or five times over the years, it kind of opens new ground, new conversation, because each of us brings its Heraclitus. You can never walk into the same river twice. <laughs> you can never be in the same barn twice with respect to Jefferson, even when you're talking about subjects that have been um, gone over on a number of previous yeah, Let occasions. me interject. Uh, as a listener myself, um, I always enjoy listening to you. Uh, well, it's, it's more fun for me because I get to pick your brain. Um, but I always learn something new, um, a perspective, an, an occurrence. There's always something new to learn. I think that's why people listen to this program, David. I think that you know, when, whenever we try to sell this program, uh, someone says, what, 52 hours per year of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I don't think we missed one last year. So people have a hard time, producers have a hard time understanding what that might mean. And I think they think that it's going to be Ben Franklin and his kite over and over and over and over. And that's not really what we do. And so I think what distinguishes our program for good or ill is that we're constantly wrestling with the character and the achievement of Thomas Jefferson. There's no finished product. It's not a Williamsburg piece where you get a, a polished performance of Jefferson, it's 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 exploring the problematic nature of Thomas Jefferson and trying to figure a figure him out, and b decide whether he really meant all this stuff about American utopia, and then c can we, the inheritors of this, make this happen? Can we? Can we, quote, ameliorate the condition of mankind and live in something like an American Enlightenment? Or was that silly when he said it, unrealistic, and it's never been realized, and it can't be realized? That's what John Adams would say. So I think that what makes this program interesting is that we're, and the people listen to it because we're wrestling with the possibilities of America through the character of Thomas Jefferson. It becomes necessary, therefore, for us to understand how he became Jefferson and not Patrick Henry or some nameless Virginia planter, of which there were hundreds of thousands, how did he become Jefferson? And so today, we began by saying, what were the conditions of his birth and upbringing? What were his relationships with his mother and his father? What sort of a young man was Jefferson, and and how did his education begin to unfold? Those are the themes that we've been sort of plucking at. And next week we'll we'll go further. We'll take him up to the revolution, I suppose. Uh, I hope so. I, I, I have to interject a couple things. Yes, sir. Uh, you, had, uh, you talked about the podcast growing, and I believe right in the beginning of this show we talked about that, but we're very, very proud uh, to announce that um, Mother Jones has picked the Jefferson Hour as one of the year's Under the radar best. Under the radar best. We were also picked, um, uh, a gentleman, David Jackson, has a school of podcasting, and he every year asks his listeners to list a favorite. Well, the Jefferson Hour was listed in that. What does that mean exactly, school of podcasting? Well, it's a podcast. You'd have to listen. But it's about what? Well, there's a number. You know, it's a subculture, really. Not hardly a subculture anymore, podcasting. Um, David Jackson... Uh, School of Podcasting. And then there was Mike Dell uh, with Blueberry, B-L-U-R-R-R-Y. Um, and he has a, a... How does that become Barry? Blueberry. Well, you get a unique spelling and it's yours. Uh, but he has a, a podcasting help desk podcast. And he, he's been great to us. Um, which then leads me into, if you like this podcast... Oh, yes. Um, we are at this point completely supported by listeners. If you, we're not going anywhere, but if you want us to stay here, um, we do uh, encourage you to support us. And we're hoping to make some 
some good and positive and forward changes this year in um, how the podcast is delivered and a number of other things. So there you have it. And shall we go to the show? Or I think we should go to the show. So this is the first of the 2016 series. It's out of character. It's Jefferson 101. And if you'd like to support the podcast, go to jeffersonhour.com, click on the donate button, and we would both say thank you. Thanks to everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, brought to you by Bismarck State College on the banks of the Missouri River at the heart of the Lewis and Clark Trail. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me is the creator of the Thomas Jefferson, the gentleman who portrays President Jefferson when he's here, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Happy New Year to you, sir. Happy New Year to you, my friend, David Swenson, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. What a great beginning of 2016 we're going to have. Yes, and um, I was hoping to uh, to get you to be here today rather than President Jefferson. You know, um, every year or every other year, we do what we refer to as Jefferson 101, and where um, we kind of go through his life and catch up with the history for those that are new to the Thomas Jefferson Hour and don't know that much about President Jefferson. And uh, I really thought it was appropriate because we have a lot of new listeners, sir. Well, we have new listeners. Uh, the the podcast world, coupled with it, with some new stations that have signed on to the Jefferson Hour all over the United States, uh, brings us a range of new listeners, and I all, but I also th- remember what Dr. Johnson said. Samuel Johnson, the great British lexicographer, one of my heroes, said, mankind requires more often to be reminded than informed. Huh. In other words, even for our, our, our veteran listeners who've, who've been with us for many, many years, um, hearing again the stories of how Jefferson became Jefferson and why Jefferson matters and what in summary, he achieved in his life. Uh, I find that always interesting to myself, even though I've been over this material hundreds and hundreds of times for a couple of reasons. First of all, when you when you read every book that comes out about Jefferson, but you you don't always finish them because the press of life moves you in some other direction or the book isn't very good, but you, you invariably read the first hundred pages. So I, I keep going over and over and over Jefferson before he got to the College of William and Mary. I mentioned that we know we have some new listeners, and we do know we have some new listeners for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, one is I have to give a thanks to Mike Dell at Blueberry. Blueberry. Blueberry, B-L-U-R-R-R-Y, which is a, a, a great service. They track podcasts, and uh, uh, Mr. Dell was just terrific in helping us get all that set up there. I, I, so I, I wanted to say thank you to him, but also... If I may brag on your behalf, uh, the Jefferson Hour was referred to as uh, one of the year's best under the radar podcasts by Mother Jones magazine. Mother Jones, the leftist workers magazine. Uh, I was surprised when I learned that. Thanks for inf- informing me of that. Actually, I think it was Rick Kennerly who uh, brought yes, it to yes, our yes, attention. Our friend right, Rick Kennerly. Yeah. So I did an interview with Mother Jones a couple of years ago. Right. And so I suppose the writer. Uh, who, who handled that interview, uh, made the pitch for the, the program. I'm glad. I, I hope we can stay under the radar in the sense of always being authentic, mm-hmm. but come above the radar just enough to get a much wider audience because I really believe that the work that we do, in some sense, it's not really about Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson is the, is the springboard or the foundation or the root from which a discussion of Jeffersonian values um, occurs 52 times per year. And I think that the, the people would stop listening if it were just purely the historical Jefferson and not the projection of Jefferson's vision of America carefully forward. I don't know. I don't know what you think about that. Well, they say uh, Jenkinson's Jefferson is more than just an entertaining impersonation. It's a vehicle for discussing political theory and the values that shaped our nation, both for better and for the worse. Um, high praise. Very high praise. And I'm, uh, I've am i always been a 
a, a great believer in the workers' movement. You know, one of the things that really troubles me about our time is the way we have betrayed uh, workers. I know a fair amount about this because I've studied the sweep of American history to a certain extent, and the working people of the world, including in the United States, have had to work so hard through so much suffering, with so much struggle, to achieve rights that we now all take for granted, workmen's compensation, uh, vacation, uh, parental leave, uh you're talking about a struggle that continues. That struggle continues, but the, the high water mark of the union movement has gone. And now we're in a period of, of sustained, slow decline of the union movement. And there are lots of people who, who, who hate unions and who regard them as nuisances and, and think that they're just cronyist and that they're, they have an, un, uh, an unfair advantage in democratic circles because they force their workers to to pay over money to candidates that they may or may not support, and so on and so forth. And, of course, there are many right-to-work states that that work hard to undermine the union movement, but I just think that it's really important for people who, who care about child welfare or sexual trafficking or the 40-hour work week or uh, unemployment compensation or equal pay. Um, th- these things, these struggles were all monumental and it took decades for these things to come to pass. And now every American worker is the beneficiary of good work conditions in the workplace and environmental safety regulations and machines that don't cripple the workers and uh, a day that is not so long that it debilitates uh, the people on the factory floor and so on. So the fact that Mother Jones... A, ma- a magazine of uh, that really lives for uh, the celebration of, of of the dignity of work. The fact that they have praised our program uh, makes me very happy. I mean, I would I prefer that say to Newsweek. Newsweek would be a bigger uh, sweep, but 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 Mother Jones really means something to me. That's great. Um, I, I want to get on to. Jefferson and and start with his youngest years. But before we we go there, one last item from um, Mother Jones is they have settled an argument, which we haven't really had to deal with in a long time. But uh, um, they write uh, the Jefferson Hour is uh, produced inside a converted farmhouse in North Dakota. Well, that's not exactly accurate. It, well, it's, it's, barn, a, it's a I barn. Mean, we it's do not, have offices here. Yeah, it, but it's it, we do, but it's not. Record. I have not slept here for many years. Yeah, it's that's, that's certain. <laughs> and it's it's cold in the winter. We uh, we occasionally slip into a studio, but you know, I said this summer we really needed to you know tighten up the insulation around the windows and the doors, but just didn't quite get it all done. You know, it's Jefferson the, would have done it. <laughs> he, well, he would have had somebody do it. <laughs> yeah. There's one of the paradoxes <laughs> of Thomas Jefferson. But, you know, but the barn has been. You know, back in Reno, we had the new Enlightenment Radio Network Tower. Right. And that made a certain kind of sense for a large city like Reno, Nevada. But but here in Dakota, it's much more Jeffersonian, I think. Well, I think Jefferson would approve. I think if he came in, he would do a lot of— He'd clean this barn. Yeah, he would do a lot of—well, he'd have somebody do it, is it? But there would be some good organization. So can we start with Jefferson as a young man, a child? We There's only so much— that we know, and I love doing these programs because I always learn something new from you. But could we start with his his youngest years, his relationship with his father? Certainly. Well, first of all, Jefferson was born on April second, seventeen forty three, but his birthday is celebrated on April thirteenth, and that's because in seventeen fifty two. England finally adopted the Gregorian calendar reforms, and 11 days had to be uh, put forward on the calendar to bring the British calendar into synchronization with the actual mechanism of the solar system. So this is a very Jeffersonian moment. The Julian calendar, which was created under the leadership of Julius Caesar, uh, was very accurate. It was an amazing achievement for its time, but it was just slightly out of sync with the actual solar year. So by the 16th century, uh, 
the calendar was off by, I think, nine days. In other words, the calendar was was out of sync with the solar system. And the, and the reason that the Catholics, that Pope Gregory demanded and got a, a, a reformed calendar is because this really affects the, the sighting of Easter. Easter is a movable feast. In other words, it doesn't occur on the same Sunday every year. And the, the Catholic world needed an accurate, a more accurate calendar so that Easter wouldn't get completely out of whack with the spring season. The Gregorian reforms are amazing. They gave us the calendar that we now have and highly accurate. But the English-speaking world, because it was Protestant and not Catholic, refused to adopt the Gregorian calendar for political reasons, for ideological reasons, when in fact, as Newton would have clearly told them, or Francis Bacon or any scientific mind, the Gregorian calendar was demonstrably better than the Julian one. And so Jefferson was born in what's known in history as old style under the under the Julian calendar on April 2nd, 1743. But when Britain and the United States in 1752 finally accepted the Gregorian reforms, his birthday was pushed forward to April 13th. And so we celebrate it on April 13th, even though if he had recorded his birth uh, in the manner of Tristram Shandy, uh, he would have recorded it as April 2nd, 1743. So I know that's a digression, but it's one that he would be find very interesting. Right, yes. And he was born at? Born at Shadwell, which is very near our Monticello. His father, Peter Jefferson, was a, a strong, resourceful, um, courageous surveyor and planter who Jefferson said was the most impressive person in his childhood, and who was, as Jefferson put it, one of the first three or four settlers in that western part of Virginia. And Jefferson always believed that the destiny of his life was set by his father, who had gone off on Indian diplomatic missions, and was a surveyor, and a map maker, and, and a westerner, effectively. He was a frontiersman from the overseer class. So Jefferson had some automatic advantages as a visionary of the American West because of um, the fact of his father's career. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you more about that, the influence his father had on him. And I know the information is sparse, but also um, the influence his mother had on him. Yes, his mother, Jane Randolph, that's another question. Well, we need to take just a short break now, and uh, we'll return to this conversation in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week, we're speaking with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and we're talking while we're doing Jefferson 101. In our first segment, we talked about uh, Jefferson, the child. You explained the calendar discrepancies and where he was born, and where we ended was uh, the influence his father Peter had on him. Um, And I was asking about about that and about the influence his mother had on him. That's kind of a mystery, isn't it? A little bit of a mystery. So let me say a couple of things about that. First of all, to really, in a a sense, begin at the beginning, the key fact in Jefferson's life is that he was born in Virginia, uh, not Pennsylvania, not New York, not New Hampshire, not Massachusetts, not Georgia, but Virginia, the biggest state, the most populous state, 
the most powerful state, but also a state of the upper South and a slave state. Had he been born in New Hampshire or Massachusetts like John Adams, his life would have been fundamentally different. Uh, The most significant single fact about Jefferson's life is that he was born at the high water mark of the Enlightenment in 1743, but in Virginia, where he grew up in a world of slavery, inherited slaves, bought and sold slaves, tracked down runaway slaves, used slaves for all of the comforts of his life, including perhaps sexually, and it's, it's, this is what I've learned in you know, three decades of thinking and writing about Jefferson, that you really can't understand Jefferson, period, unless you factor in slavery. His first memory of all of the memories of his life was being carried on a pillow on top of a horse by a trusted slave when his father, Peter, moved their family from Shadwell down to Tuckahoe uh, to manage a, a, a deceased friend's plantation. Jefferson would have been approximately two years old. And so think of it, his first memory, I don't know what your first memory, and it doesn't matter what my first memory is, but his first memory in life is of being carried by a slave on a pillow on a horse for a sustained um, distance. First of all, that's a, that's a story about privilege. Um, you know, that doesn't happen to average people. But it's also a story about how impossibly convoluted the world of slavery is. I can assure you that Jefferson's parents would not have entrusted him to someone they didn't trust. And so to put your two-year-old in the trust of a, of a senior black slave on a horse is a very trusting thing to do. Well, it certainly defines the relationship in a way that probably a lot of listeners don't think of. Um, I certainly didn't before you you told me that story. And, and the key to understanding it, David, is that this is not the caricature of slavery, of the vicious white overseer whipping and raping slaves and beating them to death and uh, some sort of impossible caste system of separation between black and white. This is a story about about the intimacy of slavery. This is, This is an intimate anecdote. And Jefferson not only remembered it, but he chose to have it remembered. You know, we only know it because Jefferson ensured that we did by keeping the documents. Jefferson's paper trail is immense, and most of what we know about him comes from his own uh, accounts of his life. And he chose to remember this story. And so I just I always try to remember this story for a couple of reasons. First of all, never to forget that slavery is the central fact of Jefferson's private life, and secondly, uh, to remember that slavery is a very complicated, nuanced, perplexing institution. It's not some sort of a cartoon caricature, and we need to understand how interwoven the lives of slaves and masters were at this period in order to understand it, and we also need to know that even though it's slavery, There could be trust, there could be friendship, there could even be love across this racial divide. And if we forget that, we are always in danger of misjudging that era of American history. So so that really matters to me. And it also, let me just say as as, as, uh, we go on that it's also the case that Jefferson was lucky to be born at the high water mark of the Enlightenment. So if he had been born... 80 years earlier, we might not know of him except as a minor figure in Virginia life. Really? You think so? Yes. Huh. That's, that's, that's interesting. Because it was a colonial world. It was, it was pre-enlightenment. Uh, he might have been a much more cookie-cutter Virginian. Well, I suppose all great historical figures are somewhat a product of the time they're oh, born course. into. Of course. So, How about I'd like to think Jefferson would have made his mark in any era. Yeah, I, I, do, I, I do always say genius will out. But I think that the Enlightenment really mattered. And we're, we're living in this very interesting late or post-Enlightenment phase of history where those, those great truths that the Enlightenment was, was focusing on are beginning really to, to come apart. But privacy, uh, 
uh, the sovereignty of the individual, uh, the rights of man, the idea that, that man is a rational creature and that he can use knowledge and science to improve himself and to improve the world, the belief that uh, the political systems need to be grounded in the consent of the governed and that the people are sovereign and, and they, they have a right to distill from amongst their own collective will whatever form of government they please, these are the principles that are enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and in the Bill of Rights and, and so on. And Jefferson happened to be born when this movement, this breathtakingly optimistic movement about humanity was in its full flower. And so the books that he read and the ideas that were circulating, um, the zeitgeist, as we say, um, the world the world software that was that was burbling and percolating around in his lifetime was that of the Enlightenment. He might have missed it as a colonial parochial Virginian, except that he went to the College of William and Mary, and there he met. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but he yes, met. Yes, we are. He met William <laughs> I'm Small. I'm going to pull you back. But in just a wait. But yes, William, William Small, his mentor at, at William and Mary was a product of the Enlightenment, and he gave Jefferson Enlightenment texts, and he talked with Jefferson in an Enlightenment way. So so to return, slavery, but not a simple institution, and the Enlightenment are the key dynamics that produce the young Jefferson. And the young Jefferson is where I wanted to slip back just for a moment, because, um, you know, it, all of us are affected by, if not our parents, those we grow up with, um, the circumstances that we grow up in. And uh, Jefferson's father, the effect that he had on him, uh, what was the quote you said how he thought him to be the greatest? The greatest he was certainly the greatest man in Jefferson's young life. He worshipped his father. His, right. his father died when Jefferson was 14. Which I think is pretty significant That's as a well. very key fact. Because, first of all, Jefferson didn't get to know his father when he was an adult. He only knew a boy's view of his father. But but his father was not uh, what they would say in those times an educated man, or was he? Uh, but he, he, he was he, self-educated. Right, and he encouraged – he had books and he encouraged – He had 40 books. Uh-huh, which was a lot. That's, that's a lot of books. That's, that, that's a very large private library for that time. And he read them, too. And it, it wasn't just a collector. He was a reader. He was an autodidact, a self-taught man for the most part. He was really of a lower class from his wife, Jane Randolph. Jane Randolph belonged to one of the best social classes so he of Virginia. he married up. He married up but because he was so extraordinary and resourceful. He was a strong man, a tall man. Uh, Jefferson told these stories about his sheer strength that he could lift two hogsheads of tobacco and from a... Um, a, a down position into an upright one. Then one time he was asking slaves to pull down a shed and they couldn't do it, so he took the rope and pulled it down himself. Uh, that he slept in trees when he was out on Indian delegations and mapping the the Virginia North, North Carolina boundary. So Jefferson looked upon him as as a kind of heroic figure, a Westerner, a frontiersman, which he was. Jefferson wasn't that. Jefferson was a very highly educated, highly privileged, very comfortable man. It's really impossible to think of Jefferson sleeping in a tree. Well, but what I'm always going to get to is is that you you said Jefferson was a highly educated man. My impression is is that started with his father. Now, do we know what books his father had that Jefferson may have read? Did he ever speak we of We know that? some of them. So the, this was kind of the standard set of books that uh, are not very well off, but but intellectually ambitious colonial would have. So Addison and Steele, they were journalist slash essayist from Britain who helped to set the style of 18th century English prose. The poetry of Alexander Pope, who was, who was the greatest poet of the age. Everyone read Pope's essay on man, essay on criticism, his Dunciad, the rape of the lock, etc. Uh, the works of Jonathan Swift, um, who was a magnificent satirist, John Dryden, a poet of a slightly earlier period, but a great British poet, uh, no longer much read, but but extremely fashionable then, and so on and so forth. So going back to the Bible, 
and then picking it up with the King James translation of the Bible and some Chaucer and Milton and Pope and Addison and Steele and Dr. Johnson. Um, so the, I guess my point is, is these were not lightweight books. These are not grocery store fiction. And his father had these books. And Jefferson, the, the family story is that Jefferson, by the time he was about five years old, was reading his way through this set of books. And how would he have learned to read in Virginia at that time? Probably from his sister Jane, possibly from uh, a tutor of some sort or from his mother Jane. Uh, slaves typically were illiterate and kept illiterate on purpose. Uh, so he either learned to read himself, which is quite possible, he's Jefferson, or he learned it from his favorite sister Jane, who was a little older than he was, or he learned it from his mother Jane, who, and Jefferson later said to his daughter, mothers in the nursery are the primary first educators of their children. So he's probably speaking in part about his own experience. Now, you said that um, we agree that, that Peter Jefferson married up. and He married into the Randolph clan. You know, That's like marrying a Rockefeller or a Carnegie or a, a Mellon. The, the question is, is I mean, he, he lived, uh, they had a, I don't want to, do I use the word affluent, but they were well-to-do. He could have uh, when you said perhaps Jefferson was tutored, uh, Peter Jefferson could have afforded that. Yes. They were land rich and slave rich and cash poor, like most planters and like most farmers today. But they they were people of means and, and there were social expectations. So, for example, Peter Jefferson was uh, a justice of the peace. Because that's what you do. You know, there, there were a set of offices. You either go to the House of Burgesses or you become the governor of Virginia or you head up the militia or Surveying. you're a judge or a justice of the peace. Surveyor is slightly lower on the social scale, but, the, but there was a set of, of expectations of certain social classes. And, and Jefferson, his father, Peter Jefferson, would have been adequate to, to achieve some of them. But when he married into the first or second family of Virginia, all doors began to open for him. Peter Jefferson didn't really walk through those doors, but his son did. And it sort of reminds me of what John Adams later said, you know, you and I must be revolutionaries so our sons can be lawyers and philosophers right. so that their daughters can be ballerinas and so on. Uh, there are many versions of that famous Adams statement, but you take the point. So, so Jefferson's father really knocked on the door of a higher... Um, place on the social scale, achieved it, then Jefferson had a very easy life. And, and I say again, he's not the kind of person who would have slept in a tree. He could not have survived on the Lewis and Clark expedition. He was not a he-man. Jefferson, I'm using a term that I don't like very much, but I want to use it anyway. He was, he was effeminate. He was delicate. He, was, he needed his creature comforts. He couldn't live without wine. He couldn't live without books. He couldn't live without musical instruments. He couldn't live without his routines. His father was not that way at all. His father was more like, well, okay, if there's a map to be made, let's go out there and we'll camp in a tree and we'll take our, our charcoal and we'll draw that map and we'll, if we meet Indians, we'll find a way to, to deal amicably with them. And if we have to eat bear, we'll eat bear and go without cleaning up for weeks and months. For, for Thomas Jefferson, our Jefferson, that would have been unthinkable. Our Jefferson is a very delicate, highly fastidious, highly, highly, highly civilized man with a, with a profound need for order and routine and certain creature comforts. And so people like Hamilton, who, who was fascinated by Jefferson but fundamentally didn't like him, they always saw Jefferson as effeminate. And he, Hamilton famously said uh, during the period when they were both in Washington's cabinet that Jefferson has, quote, a womanish attachment to France and a womanish dislike of England. And uh, and he called him an intellectual voluptuary. And right. there was always the sense that Jefferson was was a fragile person that you had to you had to you had to treat with great delicacy. That you, it was nothing rough and tumble about Jefferson. You would never find him in a tavern playing billiards. 
That's that's very interesting. I want to come back to that. If you're just joining us, you're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and this week we're discussing, well, we're really doing a Jefferson 101 with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Um, you, you talked about him being the word you didn't like to use, effeminate, but um, we need to come back to that because I, I would challenge that from a couple of things you have taught me. Um, so we've, we've kind of talked about his, his upbringing. Well, but not about his mother, however. Uh, yeah, and there's not... There's not a lot there, is there? But but I think I've learned from you, you've always suspected that there was a great influence uh, there, that we don't really, there's not proof of it. Well, we don't know a great deal about this, first of all, because Jefferson was a very, very private man. Right. Even secretive in many respects and thought that his private life was effectively off limits to historians and burned uh, some of his private correspondence, particularly that with his wife, Martha. But secondly... Uh, there's a there's a fire. So in 1770, Shadwell burned. Jefferson's young manhood home burned. He's just entering adult life. Uh, he's not there when it burned. He's in Williamsburg, and he learns that Shadwell has burned to the ground and the trusted slaves have saved a few of his books and his violin, uh, which he's very grateful for. But with the fire at Shadwell, we lose anything that Jefferson, any records Jefferson kept up till that point. And so there's this gap. He's born in 1743. The fire occurs in 1770. During that period, we, there may be a great deal of Jefferson. We can't have access to it because uh, most of that was destroyed in the fire. And so we, we have to, we know a great deal about Jefferson from 1770 on. And of course, more and more as he becomes an important national figure, but the but the childhood of Jefferson has a relative problem from the Shadwell fire um, syndrome, and so we have to reconstruct some of this. So so here's what we know about his mother: she was from this extraordinarily powerful clan, the Randolphs. Jefferson always said the Randolphs were a little odd; that they they had interbred too much and they were there was a sign of mental instability in, in the Randolph clan. His mother had been born in England. She married down, but I'm sure she lifted Peter Jefferson. She was a letter writer, she was resourceful, she was intelligent, she was strong. And so even though most historians say that was a strained relationship, I don't agree with that. I think we don't know enough to make such a judgment. Hmm. You, you, and you, do you have any any uh, any supposition that you would share? I think that that he preferred his father, but I think that he gained... Well, that'd be pretty normal. Yeah, right? he, I think he gained more from his mother. She she taught him how to be a gentleman, and she was a great letter writer. And if, if Jefferson is anything, he's a great letter writer. Agreed. We're going to take just a short break. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. This week's conversation is with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour and the gentleman who normally would portray President Jefferson, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Clay, we've talked a bunch uh, about, Je we're doing, uh, give me a better title than Jefferson 101, but that's, that's essentially what we're doing is uh, going through his life. And we've talked about his boyhood. We've talked about the influence his father had on him. And when we stopped uh, for the break, we were talking about uh, the influence his mother may have had on him. 
His father's uh, last request was that Jefferson be classically educated. So his father wanted Jefferson to, to be more than he was, a very common American trait. And Jefferson was classically educated. He was educated by tutors. How do we know that? That his father said this? Yes. Jefferson uh, writes it. He does. Jefferson wrote a fragmentary autobiography when he right. was in his 70s. Mm-hmm. He got tired of it and put it down. But we owe to that fragmentary and not really very compelling autobiography a great deal about the early years of Jefferson because he, of course, like all of us, he concentrates in a book on that which comes first. So we know this from letters that he wrote and from reminiscences of his grandchildren and from this fragmentary autobiography, which anyone who wishes can read online. It's uh, freely available. So his father wanted him to be classically educated. Jefferson was. He had tutors. So these were neighborhood Anglican preachers who supplemented their very tiny income as pastors by taking children to teach, essentially boarding schools, family boarding schools. And Jefferson had three such tutors. Now, how, what would his age have been at this time? It started when he was about nine. Oh, very young. Then. But he would have been educated at home before that. And so he had these tutors, and, and it's neither here nor there just exactly who they were and what they did. But he learned Latin and Greek. At nine? Well, beginning at nine. Uh-huh. And French. And later he picked up Italian and Spanish and a little Anglo-Saxon. But he basically would have been taught French, Latin, and Greek until he went off to the William and Mary when he was uh, 16 and a half years old. And some of these schools were very close to where he grew up. In fact, the school at, at um, Tuckahoe is right on the property. But some several of the schools he would have boarded at, at least during the week, they'd be uh, a, a, a dozen miles or more from Shadwell. So he didn't see a lot of his parents. I don't know why people think there was a strain between Jefferson and his mother. It comes from one sentence only, and that's when he says that his mother traced her genealogy well back into British aristocracy, to which let every reader assign what virtue and so on. You know, it's 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 sort of a sarcastic thing about the British upper classes, but I don't think it's really about his mother. He's silent about his mother for the most part, but that doesn't mean that the relationship was strained. It may just be that it's private. And whenever you're talking about Jefferson and women, mother, daughters, girlfriends, uh, friendships, other men's wives, there's kind of a veil of privacy that Jefferson tries to maintain. He really didn't want us having this conversation. And so the fact that we don't know more about this does not, in my opinion, point to strain. I think it's really wrong for historians to assume that. Would would that have been, how do I say, um, uh, a product of the times he lived in? I mean, was it common for men to not mention um, female uh, effect on them? Or uh, was it it uncommon? I think Jefferson is particularly private and secretive. More so than the average man. Yes. I I mean, could we see John Adams writing with love about the influence much his more. mother had. He, he, so he does. He, okay. It, it wasn't a historical thing. Uh, on the other hand, they were very deep male chauvinists, much more than we are. There have been social revolutions and gender revolutions of astonishing potency since then, especially in our own era. And Jefferson had a particular squeamishness about these private relationships. Uh, but I think even another Virginia gentleman, Madison or Monroe, or Patrick Henry would have been quite uh, reluctant to talk about their private lives. Uh, this is part of the Virginia character, which differentiates it, I think, so itself from the New York character or the New England character. So perhaps we should honor his wish- wishes and move on to his tutors. I, um, I, I, you, you said he probably about nine when he began to learn these things and studied until he was sixteen. So or, we know what that's but, like. Yeah. It, it, uh, what you know. I'm, I've always had this impression of like you know, Jefferson and how many hours a day he did this and how many – was it really that intense? He'd travel 12 miles. He'd spend the entire day studying. Do we know? Well, he wouldn't be traveling. He wouldn't be commuting. So he's either at the tutor's place or he's at, at Shadwell. But the family tradition is – 
which is corroborated, by the way, by his classmates at William and Mary, that he was a total student. And I can tell you this, as someone who's learned Latin and learned some Greek, and I have a daughter who's now mastering Latin and knows a good deal of Greek, more than I do, this is not for the faint of heart or French either. So in order to master those languages, as Jefferson assuredly did, to be able to read them and to write in them and to read anything in those languages that he might wish to read, that takes an almost unbelievable amount of labor. And you've heard of the concept of the 10,000 hours to master this or that. Right. To learn Greek the way that Jefferson learned it and Latin the way he knew it, and then to learn French, to speak it and to write it, and later Anglo-Saxon so that he could trace the beginnings of British liberty and so on, this is an enormous amount of work. There are people who are gifted with languages. I don't think Jefferson was particularly one of them. But even if he were gifted with them, it's still an enormous amount of work. So between the ages of, say, six and certainly after nine, until he was in his late 20s, you can imagine that on any given day, Jefferson is spending six, seven, eight, ten, twelve, and up to 15 hours studying. When he's not doing that, he's writing letters because le there's no way to communicate in the 18th century except by sitting down with a piece of paper and a quill pen and sharpening that quill and writing the letter. And Jefferson, of course, kept copies and made f drafts and so on, and then playing the violin. So obviously you can't do all of that every day and, and, get, and get any sleep. So we have to assume that some of this is an exaggeration and that historians extrapolate from slender evidence. But I think you can honestly say that on any given day between the ages of 6 and 26, Jefferson was mostly in his books. Now, that's not true today. If you take a, a gifted American today between 6 and 26, on any given day, they are not mostly – in their books, but Jefferson was, and it was even unusual in his time. And his classmates at William and Mary said he could he could tear himself himself away from any temptation in the world, and return to his Greek, and that it frustrated his friends that he that that Jefferson didn't play enough, he wasn't convivial enough, he didn't he didn't relax enough, he wasn't a good friend to them because, although he was loyal and solicitous and would write them letters and do anything he could for them, he didn't want to go into recreation because he wanted to be studying. You, I, um, I think about this, uh, how you describe it, and um, what an effect, well, two things, really, why he was doing this. If, he was, if it was self-motivation, he was trying to please somebody, he really enjoyed it. And also, what an effect it must have had on his mind for the rest of his life. Now, you're a Rhodes Scholar. You've been through this. You've learned languages. Um, as a young person, that has to have some sort of a an effect on how you think for the rest of your like life you you compartmentalize things and you organize things in your in your way of thinking or is that fair to say yes uh, let me say this first of all obviously whatever little learning i have is pitiful by comparison with the man that we're talking about so as long as that's understood i can extrapolate a little if you do this, if you do what Jefferson did, and, and frankly what I did for different reasons, and you, and you give your youth and your adolescence and your early adulthood to almost obsessive compulsive study, which is certainly what Jefferson did, and it's absolutely what I did, you gain something extraordinary. Uh, you get opportunities academic opportunities that might not otherwise come to you. You impress mentors who uh, take you under their wing and shape your life. You win awards and have access to uh, a range of communities that might not otherwise be available to you. And, of course, more importantly than all of that, you get to read the greatest books that were ever written in the history of, of civilization and know them and use them in your own Outlook and your vocabulary, your conversation, your way of understanding the, the, the rituals and the crises and the tragedies and the comedies and the farces of life. So he had all of that. But when you do this, when you give that much of yourself to grinding 
solitary study, you have you have shouldered off of the stage important life rituals. In other words, if you if you postpone the recreational, romantic, social agenda of your life because you're instead learning to parse Greek, those developmental things that that others are doing, that all of your friends are doing, drinking, roistering, wenching, whatever, they don't go away. They're just postponed or driven underground. And so Jefferson was always an odd duck is my point because he was always the most educated man in the room. Any room that Jefferson walked into, people would sort of draw back and they'd look on him and think, that's a very intense, shy, brilliant, extremely well-prepared young man. But they were a little detached from Jefferson. They'd much rather have a beer with X, John Marshall or John Adams. Right. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm wanting to ask this question correctly. Yes, sir. Help me if I'm, if, <laughs> if you can. But you painted a picture of Jefferson. I, when he walked into a room, he was the most educated. How much of that was his uh, unique? character and uh, assets, mental assets, and how much of that was just simple, honest, hard work? What's your, what's your take? Well, you cannot master these things without just a tremendous amount of hard work. But he was a special character. He was a genius. And, the, and, and then this set of disciplines shapes you. So it takes a certain person to want to do that. And then once you've done it, it it sort of perpetuates that persona. So we know this, that Jefferson was an extremely shy person all of his life, that he did not do well on first acquaintance. And we have many accounts by people who met him who said at first he was cool, nay, even cold and detached. And it wasn't clear that we were going to be able to get along very well. And he was very formal and and it, it didn't. He, he held his hands across his chest and he didn't make eye contact. And he, he was very. He was a little stiff. We hear this again and again and again from people who met him, and then they say, "But if you if you persevere, and you talk about the right things, and so you're not talking about the Vikings and the Steelers and the, you know, <laughs> and whether Michael Jordan was the greatest ball player of all time, if you talk about the right things and you have civility and you have a delicacy, and you have the right manners." If Jefferson thinks you're worth it, then suddenly his arms open and he embraces you, and then he's very warm and convivial, but always in a slightly formal way. So that was that's almost universally held to be Jefferson's character. So number one, shy. Number two, very earnest. Not a, he's not the he's not high fiving anyone ever. He's into it. He he's intense. He and and people think. You get into a conversation at the Second Continental Congress, and they get into some situation where they're thinking, was it Livy or Tacitus who said that in the Roman world? And Jefferson sort of raises his little hand and says, well, I believe it's Livy, blah, 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 and gives the actual date and quotes it in Latin and talks about the best translation and where you can buy it. And he'd be happy to order it for you if you'd really like to have it. And he's that kind of person who he's like he's the, he's the encyclopedia in the room. But he doesn't. He's not forthcoming. He's not standing up and pro- proclaiming his knowledge. That would be John Adams. Jefferson hangs back, and when people get into a, a, a corner, they look over at him, and he's got the answer because he's the best prepared person in the room, and everyone gets that. And so they see him as sort of this magnificent philosopher, scholar, and brilliant prose stylist. But they can't quite embrace him because he's always detached. And he's ready with information, but he's not – there's no ego. He's not standing up and calling attention to himself ever, and he's not a know-it-all. Whenever he tells you something, he says, 
You know, you probably already know this, and even if you've forgotten it, I'm sure that I'm only reminding you of things that you have learned on your own, but I, perhaps I should recall that it was when Tacitus wrote such and such in his annals. That, and so he, he never he's never a know-it-all. He's never lording it over anyone. It's always civil, gracious, uh, humble, maybe false humble at times, modest. <laughs> maybe false humble at times. Well, at a certain point, Jefferson must have realized that his persona really worked, that that the shy, the re- retiring person who's never egotistical, he must have realized this really works. It's true. It is me. But it also is an enormously effective strategy. And so I think that over time, Jefferson's natural profile, let's put it, hardened into something that he also knew how to use at times because this frustrates you when we do in-character programs and you, you're you talking about some subject and then we have to wait for Jefferson to disclaim that he didn't really know much and that he's not very important and that if he had never been born, you know, <laughs> and we go through, but, but that he realized at some point, even though he believed all of that, that that really works as a social strategy too, if that makes any sense. It does, and this has really been fun. Um, I, we're obviously we, we gotten him to college. We're going to have to revisit this next week, and and perhaps again beyond that. And Jefferson is this brilliant young man, perhaps a genius, extraordinarily well educated, not very well socially integrated, but exquisite at everything that he does. Incredibly impressive, but a little distant and alienated and he's going to make a difference in the world but he's oh, going so to need patrons next week in we'll order come to back and uh, send him send him off to college we, we can we? follow up very good thank you send so much uh, mr jenkinson and happy new year to all of our listeners we'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the thomas jefferson hour The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888-828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.